Good evening, I'm Douglas Drake. Welcome to Shaker Life. A community is known by the schools it keeps. That's the motto of the Shaker Heights public school system. Many of us have moved into this city because of the schools. And the Shaker schools are constantly upgrading themselves, for instance, with the Magnet School Program. These sophisticated computers are not located in the Shaker Heights public schools. But the fact of the matter is that our kids, when they graduate from sixth grade, might be capable of handling such equipment as this. The fact of the matter is that our children in the computer magnet at Moreland School are learning high tech. Okay, that's only a dissipation zone. Oh, wow. Yeah. You can't do it. Now, let's see. Draw to 20 over. How about 20 over, 5 down? Enter. Okay, run it. Probably will not work. Go back and make this 39 because the screen, I think, is only 39 wide. Comma 10 will be fine. Whoops. Okay, let her rip. You might get an error. Nope, there you got it. Think you can figure out the points to make a square? Uh, <coughs> all right, remember, here's the way it looks. You want to make a square, The right computers at Moreland middle. are used to right now you assist the children <laughs> in learning. It's not basically a computer <laughs> okay. program, per se, that they're learning. I've just got the it's a the learning and program. And placing the little um, blockades and figures in. Is that like a video game? Sort of. Yeah. So you started with a blank screen, huh? Yes. Wow. And you're getting this from a magazine? Mm -hmm. What magazine is that? Soft side. What? Soft side. And they use computers like you and I used to use a pencil and an eraser. Yes. Is that especially for kids or what? It's for grown-ups and kids. It just tells you to program. It, it has different articles and things you can program into Apple's computers, Atari's, TRS-80's. What kind of a computer is this? TRS-80 Model 3. You want it? Well, that's what we did yesterday. Yeah, and it says you're like, oh, next left, you're less than seven. Lest you think that the magnet schools are only high-tech, well, it's a long step from a computer maze to a fuzzy bunny. But the science magnet at Lomon School is full of fuzzy bunnies and gerbils and turtle doves and snakes and lizards and all kinds of other fun animals. And the children there learn science, hands-on experience with science. And once, once a week, we change their cages, the bedding and... Oh, really? Mm -hmm. nice. Do they uh, stay here all the time? The pets? The rabbits? Yes. Yeah. Did he have to No. Did you cut the brown one too? No, the brown one didn't. It just, we just got. If you want to shoot in this position, I will... Excellent. Glass. Let's work that glass. Hard glass. Hard glass. Hard glass. And change which form the shape or size without changing the material. Velvet. Now hold up what you think is velvet. Okay? Anybody know what that? It's been marvelous. Our children seem to enjoy science. Uh, we're getting ready to work on a science exhibit, and the boys and girls have really shown a lot of excitement in terms of selecting projects and starting to work on it. Uh, in talking with parents, they said their children express a lot of interest in the area of science. They share with them a lot of things that they've done. We set it up so that it's a hands-on type activity, which means that the children do a lot in terms of experiments. And they're presented with a problem. They work things through and come up with a solution on their own. I see. Those are turtle doves, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, has the magnets program worked here um, in, in helping with the racial balance? Yes, somewhat, and we're hoping that as a result of what we've been able to do this year, that with a recruitment program that we now have planned, that it will increase next year. These are children drawn from throughout the entire school district, right? 
Uh, they are children that are basically Lomond students, but other children in the district have the option of enrolling at Lomond and participating in the magnet program, which is basically the purpose of the magnet concept. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the uh, uh, little kids in the, in the French magnet, uh, they're learning French. Oh, without a doubt, our first graders speak no English whatsoever in the French class. And it's amazing to watch a French class and see how well they understand the instructor. Everything within the French class is done in French. Hmm. Well, w will they have the opportunity to pursue this in, in other grades later on? It is our hope that by the time our first grade students get to sixth grade that they will be advanced in French so that the children will be ready for advanced French at seventh grade level. Uh, one of the things we are also talking about this year is the possibility of sending our children to Quebec so that they could have French experience in another country. Mm. I'll sign up for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Nicole, viens. Avec qui? Qui va venir le faire? Qui va venir le faire le dialogue? Charles, bien, bien, Charles. Allez, vous allez, mettez-vous au milieu. Mettez-vous au milieu comme ça. Well, it may not be Quebec, but in the French bonjour, magnet at Lomond School, the kids are learning to parler français. Comment t'appelles-tu? Je m'appelle Nicole. Quel âge as-tu? J'ai 7 ans. Quand? Quel âge as-tu? Quel âge as-tu? J'ai 6 ans. Au revoir. <coughs> So to throw the ball and, and then sing a song with it, and then turn around and catch it at the end. And uh, Janine, did you have a hard time learning that song? Um, no. No? no. Is it fun? Yeah. yeah. What do you like best about the French class? Um, numbers. Numbers, huh? You like those best because you're better at numbers? No. No? It is fun. It is fun, huh? Can you sing that song for me, the one you just sang? Yeah. Okay, go ahead and do it. I love the jolly pan, oh, ballon to be on. Oh, that's what you were doing. And uh, Shiloh, you were at the puzzle table. Go back and do a few more before activity time is over. <laughs> Another interesting element in the magnet school program in the Shaker schools is the all day kindergarten magnet. The kids have a lot of fun, and they spend the entire day in school. And there, they get a chance to expand their imagination. Is that Yogi Bear? No. It's a design. It's a design. What were you thinking about when you made it? A ladybug that I messed up. A ladybug? Where did, where's the ladybug part? It's this part. Oh, I see. But then when, that, that went wrong, so you decided to do something else, huh? Mm-hmm. That's a pretty design. Are those ears or handles, do you think? Handles. Handles. So you might be able to pick this up and carry it away, huh? Yeah, what is that? Oh, a design. It's a what? A design. A design. Nice. And what colors have you used? Yellow, green, red, blue, and red. How did you think of that idea? Um, in my mind. In your mind? Yeah. You like kindergarten? Yeah. Why? Because, because I like the snacks. You like the snacks, huh? Do you learn anything? What do you learn? Letters. Oh, I see. Which do you like best, snacks or letters? Uh, snacks. It is in the morning. We do uh, the regular things that would be found in any kindergarten. Reading, math, language work, um, science and social studies, and enrichment kinds of things we do more in the afternoon. 
Do you think that the uh, the kids are ready for this full day? Very much so. I have I have found all of the children that I've had this year very much ready for a full day experience. How do the parents react to it? Uh, our res the response has been very favorable this year. Um, this was our first year getting into it, and um, I think all of us were wondering, well, would they be ready? And um, I think everybody, um, parents and teachers, have been surprised at how fast and quickly the children really did adjust to the program. Say, whisper, step, step, step. Music class in the magnet kindergarten, well, that hasn't changed very much from the days when you and I took music in kindergarten. Shaker Heights is a fortunate community, fortunate in the respect that there are many nice homes with many nice yards, pretty lawns. Those lawns don't just happen by accident. People work hard to make them look good. Today we take a brief look at how do you have a nice lawn? We talk to a couple of experts to get some hints. Some of us have so much water in our backyards that we never have to mow. Most of us, however, are watering the lawns during the summer. We're also adding nutrients and herbicides and all sorts of other additives to take care of our beautiful lawns. In the winter, we get water in the form of snow, and then that rots the lawns. Just listen to Jack Bolster, a professional horticulturist. There's, there's a lot of damage. This lawn, this particular bent grass, is very, very susceptible to snow mold damage. And you can almost see along the sidewalk here where snow was probably piled up, it's more severe than out in the, yeah. some of the other parts of the lawn. It's a case of moisture and temperature. With the proper temperature, good moisture conditions, this disease is prevalent in the, in the lawn today. Now here again, this is on a bent lawn, which is very susceptible to snow mold. You may have a grass that is not, and you'll never see this condition. But here's a prime example of what can happen to a lawn. Now this isn't permanent. This lawn hasn't been destroyed in any way. Uh, getting back to what I said uh, earlier about getting out with a rake or loosening this material up, loosening the lawn up, just a, a thatching, verticutting, or brushing over with a rake is probably the answer for this right now. Uh, an application of a fungicide at this time would help it, uh, prevent it from getting any worse. But you as a homeowner would probably just want to get out and brush this over so that when the sun hits it, it dries it out. And with a nice application of fertilizer, it should green up in a matter of a couple weeks. So you wouldn't want to rip this out? Oh, no, no. This is, this is not a case where you tear out the lawn. It's not a case of doing any reseeding even. Mm -hmm. Very seldom do we have to reseed from snow mold damage. There are occasions when you might. Help is as close as the corner hardware store for lawn care basics, foods and other fertilizers, and advice. Get a good cleanup of, of your lawn. Uh, over years, you have an, uh, an accumulation of um, dead grass, debris, thatch, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it would be critical to, uh, to rake up the stuff, the uh, thatch and debris, uh, so we can get our soil to start breathing okay uh, before we start putting seed down um, that's probably about the first thing that no one likes to do but we all have to do it you actually have to dig up the soil then? no just yeah. a, a good raking mm -hmm. uh, would do it or you can rent a uh, thatching machine mm -hmm. uh, if your lawn's in bad shape so to speak mm -hmm. what does that do that, that cleans off the old the thatching it removes all the dead grass and thatch it's in the lawn uh -huh. to get your ground just where it's just the ground, the grass, and there's no dead debris there. I see. The, the average person can do a fine job, especially if he seeks a little help on the side. We have very knowledgeable people all over this area, mm -hmm. the Cleveland Garden Center. Most of the stores where you might deal can supply you with information, mm -hmm. as long as you take the time to seek out these people. I see. So I think that uh, your best bet when you're looking at your lawn, especially at this time of the year when it's all ahead of you, mm -hmm that the best thing to do is to get some advice, a good advice ahead of time mm -hmm. so that you're not caught later on making mistakes and buying the wrong materials and things like that. Yeah. A lot of money is wasted in this business and your garden supply dealers will tell you this. Mm -hmm. They sell a lot of products to people 
or they know that they're going to be wasted, but they can't be out there giving this information to everybody. They rely on the person who comes into the store to perhaps ask them a few questions. They can supply the information. You as a homeowner, first of all, before you start spending money, measure your lawn. If, we're if you just want to talk about a lawn right now, uh -huh. when you go to buy something for your lawn, that bag is going to tell you so apply this material at so many pounds per thousand square feet or so many ounces if you're spraying mm -hmm. per thousand square feet well if you have no idea of the size of your yard what are you going to buy you're probably going to guess mm -hmm. then you're going to go home and find out that you probably have too much material and the next mistake you may make is by saying well if 50 pounds will do a good job, I'll use 100 and really do a fine job. Now this is probably one of the worst things you can do, but people will do that when they yeah. find that they have materials piling up in their garage. Mm -hmm. Follow the instructions on the label, but in order to follow those instructions, you have to know first what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Same thing as far as the problem is concerned. Uh, at this time of the year, you're going to want to fertilize your lawn because you want it to, to recover from some of this winter damage that we've had. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, you're going, you may want to use an insecticide, a fungicide on the lawn, or crabgrass control. But in any case, all these materials are applied at definite rates to do the proper job. Mm -hmm. And this is probably one of the most important things that I can tell you as a homeowner who is going to go out and buy materials for the work that you're going to do on your yard. I see. Do you necessarily have to have a spreader? Uh, yes, uh, in the sense that this bag right here is a 5,000 square foot bag. And to put this down over an area of 5,000 square foot, you have to do it in a precise way. I mean, once you start putting down with your hand, you're going to throw half out, and an area is probably about like this big. Mm -hmm. And that's probably 30 times too much fertilizer I see. in one area. And what a spreader does, it lets it. Uh, drop onto the ground in an even mm -hmm. precision way. I see. So that's really an essential uh, implement. Very that's essential, yes. Sure. What is the the biggest problem, do you think, that, that the homeowner in taking care of his lawn encounters? Uh, I don't think there's any one big problem. Mm -hmm. It depends on you. Some people are plagued by weeds. Some people are fanatics. If they see one dandelion in their lawn, they're embarrassed by it or they're running out there to dig it out. So weeds could be a big problem for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend, uh, I can overlook weeds. If they're green, they're okay. Well, no, I don't mean that, but I can overlook them because I know that with the chemicals we have today, I can kill those weeds anytime I want. Oh, really? I so, okay. so I look at them a little differently than you, than you might look at mm -hmm. those weeds. Maybe they've been a headache to you for years and you've had trouble getting rid of those. So weeds could be a problem for you know a particular individual. Uh, I think disease problems in the summer are one of the biggest problems we have here in this area. And it, it stems from uh, the type of grass you have, the growing conditions, weather conditions, watering practices. Mm -hmm. So many things affect this. And if you're trying to grow a nice lawn, a fine lawn, you will run into these problems. And that's probably an area where the homeowner is least able to cope with these things and this is where he really needs professional advice yeah. because not knowing uh, how often to water or how what, well what yes he may look out and see brown spots in his lawn as I mentioned earlier uh, a disease problem can occur overnight yeah uh, let's say that uh, we're in July it's warm as can be you look out one day and gee your beautiful bent lawn is turning brown you see big brown patches the first thing you want to do is water you say oh my goodness mm -hmm. I've got to water it's probably the worst thing you can do. <laughs> See? So uh, it's a case of knowing how to handle these problems. And here again, uh, the average homeowner isn't going to have all this knowledge. If he wants a beautiful lawn, if he wants a manicured lawn, he's going to have to have some outside professional help. I don't mean costly help necessarily. Mm -hmm. but some uh, help. Some help, and if you know, if he's wise enough to obtain this help, he's going to save himself a lot of money. Yeah. The garden store dealer doesn't want to sell you products that are going to be wasted. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for it. He has enough customers, and if you, if you do a good job with these materials, you're going to be back to him to buy more and buy the proper things. So he wants to sell you right. the proper materials. By the same token, he can't do that unless you help him out. Yeah. And the only way you're going to help him out is to take a little time to measure your lawn, mm -hmm. to do a little reading, and to consult people. And it's not hard to do. You can pick up the phone and call the garden center. If they can't solve your problem, perhaps they can put you in touch with someone who can. So there's a lot of avenues here. But as to any one particular major problem, it's hard to pinpoint 
right now in this area. Yeah. What makes an attractive community? Pretty yards, yes. But good solid housing stock is perhaps even more important. The point of sale housing inspection was introduced five years ago in Shaker Heights. We thought we'd take a look at it and see, is it really working? The law says you have to have your house inspected by the city when you sell it, and all violations must be corrected. Inspector Dan Cray was making a reinspection of the Smith residence on Broxton Road. We went along with him. I was talking about the painting on these areas. Mostly all the window sills are bad and do need paint. Uh -huh. Generally speaking, this house isn't uh, that bad, but it, if it's not taken care of soon, it will deteriorate uh, quite fast. The problem with this door, it had swollen, and it would not close properly. So now it closes. They have it locked from the inside, but it also would require minor touching up of the paint. You can see where some of the paint is peeling off. And this is why, basically, it had swollen up to a point where it would not close, because it wasn't painted properly and the wood was not protected, and therefore it made the wood swell up and the door would not close. It wasn't cleaned properly because there is paint there and it hadn't been painted before. But the way it's peeling, it gives me an indication that there may either be a little bit of moisture or not properly prepared when it was painted before. I think this one has been a, a well-maintained house. There are a few minor uh, violations that I had found, and this is something normal in this climate as far as the uh, painting. Uh, most homes do have uh, some type of exterior peeling of the paint and so forth. But on, on the whole, uh, this house is uh, well maintained, I would say. The problem with that door was that when the paint came off, it caused moisture to get into the wood. Right. It? it wasn't properly maintained. Okay, at this relief valve, there was no overflow pipe that would extend down to the floor. And the reason for this is in case someone would happen to be standing here and this pipe is not there, they could be scalded with hot water. Inspector Cray met with the contractor who had repaired the residence, and they discussed the fan in the swimming pool room. Well, I would check that maybe those bolts may have rusted over the years with all the moisture and so forth in Right. Well, no, it was... There was definitely, uh, you know, added vibration when we added the box to it. If it's properly bolted, try that and uh, see if it, uh, you know, uh, runs at the proper speed without any vibration. Mm -hmm. well, okay. Shall I just fall in the pool? Yeah. Well, Mr. Smith, my uh, reinspection shows that there are two violations that had not been corrected. And one is the uh, touching up of the peeling paint on the exterior. The other is the lamp post. And the electrician tells me that he's going to take care of that one. When these items are completed, we will then issue you a certificate of compliance that all violations had been satisfactorily completed. Fine. And we don't get anything then until they're all finished. N not at this right? time, no. Okay. Uh, if you decide to sell the house, you decide to sell. If your house is sold, <laughs> uh, you can sell with the touching up of the paint if the violation is assumed by the seller or the buyer, and then I will then issue a letter to the title company stating that these uh, one violation is not corrected and so forth. Well, as soon as the weather changes, we plan to have the mm. painting done, so hopefully we can get them all removed. I would say that we're probably very lucky in, in uh, the quality of housing that we have in Shaker Heights for the simple reason that Shaker Heights was developed on a higher plane or a higher quality when the houses were first built. We have many amenities in our houses that probably in other suburbs they do not have. We have uh, more than adequate generally electrical systems more than adequate plumbing system. So we are very fortunate in having the, the housing stock that we do have in the city of Shaker Heights. Joe Cullock heads up the building department and he believes firmly that this is a good law. Were houses built better 50 years ago? Uh, I won't say that houses were built better. I would say houses were built of materials uh, and substantially heavier framing materials and so forth. As the years went by they 
change the dimensions of lumber and so forth. And I will say that I think at that time, too, the craftsmen were a, not a better craftsman, but they were allowed to work longer on a project than they are today. Cost is one of the things that drive up the, the, rap the rapidity of um, construction, and so I don't think you quite get the material quality and that was building a house many years ago. Yeah, I understand. Do you, do you think that the uh, overall, that the point of sale housing inspection is something that we're going to live with uh, for a long time? I think you're going to live with it. I think other communities around us are going to live with it. And in fact, I think the whole country is going to have to learn to live with it. Because this is the only way that we're going to maintain the housing stock that we have in this country, especially due to the high interest rates that are coming about. And the house has to last a lot longer because of the interest rates than it did at present. Sure. You may have noticed this cute fellow behind me uh, in stores on placards or perhaps on bumper stickers and cars running around in the city these days. It's all part of the Be a Shaker Shopper campaign to urge the people of Shaker Heights to utilize the shops and the resources here in our own community rather than spending our money out of town. On a recent cold and blustery day, a bunch of little shakers joined the mayor, council members, and community volunteers to present the first Shaker Shop of the Month award. Every month, a shop in Shaker Heights will be recognized for meeting stringent criteria. Next month, shops in the Chagrin Lee Avalon area will be evaluated. And next week, Shaker Life will present a special edition of Shaker Life, dealing with the crisis precipitated upon our schools by the state of Ohio. Thanks for watching Shaker Life. I'm Douglas Drake. Mm -hmm.